Welcome everyone to our event today on fiscal policy and fiscal rules at Bruegel. The topic we are going to discuss today, I think is, is, is really important because during the past two years, when the pandemic hit Europe, first of all, it hit many people, many people have died, many people became sick, but it also devastatingly hit our economies then fiscal policies throughout Europe and elsewhere in the world provided really exceptional fiscal support. <clears throat> First of all, to help the public health situation and also uh, to dampen the adverse impact of the pandemic on the economy and unemployment and on people. But as we are luckily coming out, at least in economic terms, from the, from the deep recession of, of last year, also the question comes when and at what pace and in what composition the extraordinary fiscal support that was provided should be withdrawn. And at the same time, this question is also quite relevant in light of the ongoing discussion of the European Union's economic governance framework. Currently, the European Commission has invited all kinds of stakeholders to express their views on various aspects of, of economic governance in Europe including on fiscal rules uh, and such issues that, that how the fiscal rules could be, could be made more effective. Also very important aspect is the green dimension because the European Union has very ambitious green targets, both for 2030 and also 2050, which will likely require more green public investment. It's also a major question how fiscal, whether fiscal rules should, and if so, how they should incentivize more green public investment. So I think both topics, both the, the policy and the rules side, I think are very much interrelated and, and, and the hot topic in the, in the coming weeks and months, uh, I think in many different circles, including among the ministries, ministers of finance, these topics are discussed. And I'm very pleased today to have three excellent speakers in a, in a panel discussion. Uh, let me introduce them in alphabetic order. So Maria Demertzis is the deputy director of Bruegel. Michel Hiedra is the director for, of international financial affairs at the Dutch Ministry of Finance. And Katja Lautar is the state secretary at the Slovenian Ministry of Finance. And certainly Slovenia is currently holding the ro rotating EU presidency and uh, and I believe uh, uh, your Ministry of, of Finance, uh, Katja, organizes many, many different events uh, on discussing these issues. So let's, I would suggest to structure our discussion into two parts. In the first part, we would more focus on, on the fiscal policy, what would be desirable under the current circumstances. For a moment, let's take aside the possible constraints imposed by fiscal rules. And in the second half of our discussion, I suggest we discuss how and whether the rules should be changed, the existing rules should be changed, and if so, how. So <clears throat> I just would like to ask each of you to have some brief in initial remarks. So maybe let, let, let's start with, with uh, uh, Katja Lautar from, um, from the Ministry of Finance of Slovenia. So Katja, what do what you think, what would be the, given the current circumstances, also the uncertainty about the current wave or the current fourth wave of the, of the pandemic that also talks about that the fifth, fifth wave might, might also come, but at the same time, the European economies are recovering. So in, in your view, what would be the most desirable way of fiscal policy going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Zolt and colleagues from Bruegel and uh, Misha and Maria. Many thanks. I think uh, the question hits the right uh, attitude that is uh, currently rising from the moment. Actually, I, I would like to start like this, that uh, this EU reaction in COVID crisis is rather different than it was in previous financial crisis. Another point I would like to mention is that we should uh, learn lessons from the past and all the lessons that we have seen from the past must, must now be taken on board. And the third thing that I really think that we also see from the fiscal uh, policy point of view that one size does not fit all. 
just short elaboration for uh, the future of fiscal policy. Uh, now we are now we are actually facing almost the three year of so called general escape clause. And what you really need is to discuss uh, the clarity of fiscal framework, not only for 2023 but also on medium term. Of course, we created EU level instrument. We all are fully aware of it. This is a new approach in um, economic policy coordination, and we we all need to see the final impact of it. But uh, nevertheless, we are fully aware of that we should restore the fiscal rules. But uh, on the other hand, we also need to have a room of maneuver to support all recovery and other investment needs that really need to be in place in future years. So what I'm reflecting on is actually that we should really talk about the sufficient length of the adjustments when we are going to come and how we are going to reduce our debt levels and deficits in a way that we do not jeopardize neither recovery, neither resilience, neither the, neither the future uh, development in EU. Just one reflection more, looking at the EU level, and uh, I know it's not comparable to the United States, but nevertheless, for the United States, Congress Budget Office projects that the deficit rule of minus three will be reached only in 2030. So I also personally think that we have a room of maneuver in terms of speed, quality, and also the size of reduction. So from start like this, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me have a quick follow-up question since you, you, you started to make a transatlantic comparison. So if we compare the recovery of the United States and Europe from the, from the COVID crisis in economic terms, then what we see is that the United States returned to the pre-pandemic trend line. So in the US there was a drop, but, but they, are, they are back and, and have a relatively fast growth. In Europe, we are also recovering, but much slower. And also it seems that the European growth tra trajectory is relatively far from the, from the pre-pandemic trend line. Now, we also know that the US provided a more sizable fiscal stimulus than on average in the, in the EU. And I wonder whether you think that was an important factor in the, in the faster US recovery and whether that has any lesson for, for us in, in Europe. Okay, my reflection on it, of course, as you as you mentioned, Zolt, it was a different reaction from United States than it was from uh, the Euro uh, and Euro area. But uh, any the way they really adopted really a long uh, portion of measures up to 10% is GDP. On the other hand, we in Europe, we really focus more on liquidity supports, let me say potential liabilities that might be in place. So I guess this is also a case, uh, how can I answer to your question? It's important to keep investment levels as high as possible. Of course, the investment must be spent in efficient manner towards green and digital. And in, on the other hand, we must also leave automatic stabilizers to do their own uh, work and path uh, through the crisis. So yes, I think this is also a lesson, lesson for uh, Europe to, to take it on board. Thank you, thank you very much. Now let me turn to Michelle, but before just let me indicate to the audience that you can ask questions on Slido. So type slide.do and then the, the, the keyword fiscal and, and please ask questions. I will, I will monitor the questions that you ask. And in the, in the final part of our, of our conversation today, I will ask those questions from the, from the three panelists. But now let me turn to, to, to Michelle. Uh, again, my, my, my question to you is relatively is, is exactly the same. So how do you see the, the desirable course of fiscal policy going, going forward? And I mean, it might also reflect something, your views on the, on the US-EU difference in, in fiscal policies, both the, the total amount and the composition adopted in the past two years. So how, how do you see the best way of fiscal policy in the coming years? Thank you, Zolt, and uh, hi, Katja, hi, Maria. 
um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a very timely question uh, that you ask. Um, if you would have asked the question um, four weeks ago, I would have said we are in a, a very good situation. Uh, we have strongly recovered from the crisis. And I think uh, um, the Eurozone will reach the level of its uh, pre-pandemic GDP uh, uh, at the end of this year. Of course, not in every individual country, but as a whole. Um, and it seems also that unemployment levels uh, uh, seem to go down rapidly. Um, and we have had some upside surprises. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we now have negative surprises again, as you mentioned, uh, the fourth wave. Um, and therefore, I think it's important to keep uh, uh, support measures in place um, as long as they are needed in a very targeted manner. Katja already mentioned the European nature of the support being not broad based, but also very targeted to the sectors where it was most needed. And I think that is a success of the, the European approach of the support provided. If you look now at the US, um, their unemployment is low, but their total uh, rate of, of workers, uh, the participation rate is still below their, their pre-pandemic level. There are a lot of discouraged workers. Whereas in Europe, because we have our social model, because we had the short-term worker schemes, we see that unemployment is, is, is going down, but at the same time, participation rates uh, actually uh, go up and therefore we have quite some tight labor markets, uh, which will also influence uh, um, our future paths. Um, in some countries, labor markets are so tight that even if we want to step up investments, it's sometimes hard to realize them um, because there are long delays uh, in projects as there are insufficient workers uh, available. Um, looking forward, I think we should uh, uh, indeed withdraw the support, all the temporary support, and return um, uh, to, to the fiscal pass uh, before the pre-pandemic crisis. Uh, but we also need to look strongly at growth. Um, and it seems um, uh, we are not yet at a pre-pandemic growth uh, trend, but at the same time, all the digitalization uh, that we've seen, a rapid overnight digitalization, might have also brought us on a, whole, uh, on a higher growth path. Uh, I know the commission has done some analysis in that regard and that might be a first positive element uh, that we can see going forward, um, a small light uh, uh, within the crisis. And I think uh, um, at the, fix, uh, the future fiscal mix will need to be uh, 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 different for different countries. I think low debt countries are the countries that, that will get fewer support probably from the, from the RRF, not everywhere. Of course, Eastern European countries that still need to do a lot of catching up will also get a sizable amount. But in general, these countries will need to invest more in digital and green. High debt countries, uh, on the other hand, they will have the uh, RRP support and uh, uh, that will enable them to help to make the green and digital transition. And at the same time, they need to rebuild fiscal buffers because what we have seen during the general escape clause period is that uh, 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 unfortunately in some countries uh, uh, expenditures were also increased structurally and that is uh, in the long run unsustainable and hopefully the RRP money can help to keep investments going also in these countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, shall, we will certainly come back to the issue of debt sustainability in the, in the second part of our discussion, then we would, we would focus on, on fiscal rules. But let me also have a follow-up question because you started saying that, you know, if we had even four weeks ago, then, then the situation looked, looked much, much nicer. Now, you know, what, what will happen if this pandemic will last much longer than we expect? Because we, again, in the spring, we expected that, you know, by the summer or the autumn, uh, <clears throat> Most Europeans will be vaccinated, which is actually, actually happened. Now we still see, you know, big rise in infect infections, some also rise in death rates, unfortunately. What happened if, if you know, if this pandemic will last long and there will be a fifth wave, a sixth wave, a seventh wave? Uh, so how to how to calibrate? Should we basically just always watch how the situation is looking and decide on the withdrawal of fiscal support by checking how the pandemic or or what, what guidelines would you give to finance ministers on how to sequence the withdrawal of fiscal support? Um, 
No, uh, uh, indeed, uh, the $100 uh, billion dollar question, uh, um, and what happens uh, uh, with COVID going forward? I think, uh, uh, of course, we don't know whether there will be uh, a fifth wave or even a sixth wave uh, or how COVID might evolve in the future. For now, uh, uh, the good thing is that we see a clear disconnection between the deaths and the hospitalizations and the number of infections. So the more important number becomes uh, how many people are at the ICU units. And that is, of course, also strongly related to the vaccinations. So let's continue to push for vaccinations. Um, and let's hope that indeed we can prevent a, a fifth or a sixth wave in, in, in that regard. Um, uh, but until uh, uh, we have arrived there, I think we should still uh, target our support. We have seen what works well. Short-term work schemes work well, but they are... Uh, the economy is also gradually adopting. Uh, um, in the first wave of the pandemic, we saw a lot of companies using the short-term work schemes. In the, uh, in the second and third waves, very fewer companies used it. So we see the economy already adopting to a more digital world. The fact that we do this seminar online is also something we would have imagined two years ago. So uh, I think the support can also be slightly smaller in this wave uh, than in the previous waves. And uh, hopefully uh, we will be out of this uh, at least uh, somewhere in the middle of next year. Thank you very much. Now, Maria, let me turn to you. And also building on, on one of the, the, the important points uh, Michelle just said, that namely companies are, are getting more and more adopted uh, to the to the situation of of you know this <clears throat> lasting pandemic digitalized work uh, working from home uh, and so on so in light of that and and certainly focusing on the fiscal issue do you so what do you think the the, the composition of fiscal support should be so should it be continue to be very much targeted on uh, on the most hit sectors and and and, and people or whether fiscal policy should more sooner or later move to more broader support for, for demand. So how, how do you see the desirable fiscal policy at the, at the current state of the European economy? Yeah, thanks very much, Zoltan, and, and very well, welcome also on my, uh, on my part to Katya and to, uh, to Michelle, and thank you for joining us on, on, uh, with your vast experience on the issue. Um, so Zoltan, to, to your question on the, on the immediate fiscal support and how to calibrate it, the size and the composition, that, that is what I would call a short-term issue. It's the immediate thing. How do you design policy immediately on the fiscal side to deal with the problem as it unravels? Um, and, and, but there is also a broader issue that the role of fiscal policy as we move forward in a sort of a much more medium and, and long term. Um, and, and let me, if I, if you allow me, Zot, I'd like to sort of tackle them that way around, starting from the big picture and then can go to the immediate one. Uh, because also, you know, the way that you answer the role of fiscal policy in the long term will define also how you should think about the fiscal policy in the short term. Um, and to the extent that this is changing by comparison to what we have known and understood up to now, I think it's important to sort of reveal that first. And, and let me start with, with one important thing, which I think should be part of the, of the answer as we begin to think about fiscal policy in the future. When Maastricht Treaty was, this, was, was signed and the rules were designed, the way that we thought about fiscal policy was very different to the needs and the way that we use fiscal policy now. If you think back then, the issue of fiscal coordination, which effectively is what, what the Maastricht Treaty was about on the fiscal side, it was very much about preventing the negative spillovers from, uh, from fiscal behavior across countries. Um, but textbook fiscal policy at the time was telling us that you know there is no real role for fiscal policy beyond the uh, the automatic stabilizers. That was really the what we thought fiscal policy ought to do. And to the extent that politicians use fiscal policy to do something different, they should be penalized or at the very least constrained. Um, this was really what we thought fiscal policy to do. Now, monetary policy had a very different role. It had to be done by independent policymakers. And of course, back then we were advocating for coordination between the, the macro management, but fiscal policy was the underdog in this, in this, uh, in this it will be not used actively to manage the economy. You know, shift, uh, fast forward 30 years later from our sixth treaty, we have two once in a lifetime crisis, global crisis. One was purely economic in nature. A second one is not economic in nature, but it has got huge economic repercussions. And you know, in the past 10 years, we've learned to use fiscal policy a lot more actively. So the question is, what do you think fiscal policy, what the role of fiscal policy is gonna be going forward? And I think 
given also what we just discussed, uh, uh, Michelle said that, you know, if you had asked me four weeks ago, meaning the levels of uncertainty under which we haven't taken these decisions change even within four weeks. But I think as we move forward and looking at the challenges ahead, then the green transition, digitalization, and of course, solving the pandemic, the role of the state in fiscal policy is gonna be much bigger than we thought and much bigger than we thought back in, in, in the design of the Maastricht Treaty. So I think the question is, when you think about fiscal policy and how to come back to a set of rules, understanding in my view that the role for fiscal policy is gonna be much bigger than we have ever imagined is important in calibrating this. So that's, that's the long term. So in the short term, to come to your question, what, what do we do? How do we do next? Well, that's an important part. We, we don't start from a clean slate. We have got huge indebtedness positions for some countries. The issue of debt sustainability will become relevant at some point. In particular, if you think about uh, the ECB no longer supporting uh, through its uh, purchasing power pr uh, program, we are going to have issues of fiscal sustainability that will be real. And we should not allow this to prohibit our ability to meet our long-term targets uh, in any way. So designing fiscal policy that is going to achieve that, in my view, is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, crucial. Therefore, when you continue fiscal support in the short term, you need to make it very targeted targeted by uh, viability and by value added. So we, can, we cannot continue to support uh, firms across the board. We have to be a lot more targeted in terms of whom we support and how long we support them for. And, and I think if, looking back, actually, while at the time the important question was support everybody fast, this is no longer the case. We don't have to support everybody fast. We need to support them who are going to provide the greatest productivity gains to the economy. I think that's important. And of course, use social policy to do other things. Social policy is there to do redistributive elements and, and different things. But I think in terms of continued fiscal support, it has to be much more targeted now than it was right at the beginning, rightly so. Many thanks, Mar thanks, Maria. Now let me push you a little bit on this on this targeted support and and ask about its possible impact on on productivity. I know a topic you very very closely follow, because if we basically if we support firms in certain sectors, we might you said that we should only support viable firms, but I think um, uh, someone working for a minister of finance, it's not so easy to determine which firms are viable and and, and which not. And if you basically support firms in a, in a particular sector, we might also support those who are not very productive and <clears throat> not have the reallocation of, of resources across the economy. And in fact, that might have an adverse impact on, uh, on, on productivity and medium term growth. So how do you see this, this problem of, of, let's say, not <clears throat> allowing a cre creative destruction to happen and whether that could have that would impact pro pro productivity or not? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, well, your question is, is a very fundamental question, right? And that's exactly how we should think about the issue. Uh, if we look back a little bit on how fiscal support was given and ask the question, was the money well spent? Um, I think on the whole, the money well, was well spent. It went in the, it went where it ought to have gone. Uh, remember that not all companies actually used the fiscal support that uh, was needed, meaning that actually the economy adapted, and I think Michelle used the, raised this point as well, um, the economy did actually manage to adapt, but what did help is indeed, and that's why actually I said the issue of targeting is important, what actually did help is when we did a little bit of due diligence in terms of allocating the right uh, money the right way, and in the past year and a half, when banks were involved in distributing the money, and you gave them incentives to do so, namely that loans were not 100% guaranteed, for example, but let's say 80% guaranteed, then banks had the incentive to do the due diligence and actually managed to funnel money in the right, in the right companies. By right, I mean those who, could, who needed it and could use it. Um, now, that was also given next to sort of the short-term uh, labor uh, uh, worker uh, schemes, which were have a very different objective than maintaining productive capacity. So, I mean, I think that now that we have a little bit more breathing space, meaning that, well, we need to get used to the fact that pandemic is not going to be ending anytime soon, not next year, uh, we have the opportunity to be a, a bit more targeted there. What I cannot see uh, very clearly right now is whether um, companies have adjusted enough 
to the challenges ahead. There is a pessimistic camp and an optimistic camp in this direction. Many who argue that actually many companies have digitized very successfully and will have long-term gains in productivity. Others who don't see it quite so optimistically. I'm not so clear on this. Uh, I think the jury is still out in terms of how much of an adaptability uh, the, the degree of adaptability of firms has actually helped in terms of productivity in the future. I'll leave it at that. Many, many thanks, Maria. Um, now let's let's move to the to the second question or second main issue that that in fact you Maria already alluded to that when you referred to the Maastricht tre Treaty uh, uh, more than more than two decades ago, and what was the assumption, economic assumption, uh, assumption behind. Now we know that the fiscal rules which, which grew up from the Maastricht Treaty has been amended many times. There was a major reform in the early 2000s, then another major reform after the global financial crisis around 2011, 12, and, and 13. And had a lot of discussion that, that whether there is a need or not for, a, for, a, for another uh, major reform. So let's also ask this question. Um, and 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 see what how what's what's your the view of, of of the three of you, so so Katya, if you could if you could start this discussion, I know I mean as you know a state secretary of the country with having the rotating presidency, you can't can't give us you know a, 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 I would say a very precise description of how the rules should be should be revised. But still, I would I would very much interested in how how do you see whether there is a need for for reform and if there is a need, what aspects of the rules should be reformed and and in what time horizon? Okay, thank you, Jean. Yes, I uh, love to do it because actually I'm coming from the country that has unfortunately faced faced all the unflexibility issue of current rules uh, since we were never applicable for any flexibility clause, although our debt was uh, just roughly above the 60% and we were in surplus uh, and we were treated in the same way like, uh, like some other countries because of not fulfilling exact numbers that are written in metrics or we face the problems with the calculation of output gap etc but let me start like this uh, i personally think that the review is really in the right time and i there should be really a broad discussion and consensus on it uh, we are fully aware of also what is realistic and what can we well in a way how can we go forward even misha mentioned that the, uh, that there is a new paper also from the commission, what does it mean the fulfillment of rules like, like we have them now in the metrics in terms of fiscal effort and one twentieth of uh, debt. So I think that we should be all aware of that the fiscal sustainability in medium and long term is our final aim. But it's really difficult to explain to let me say to politicians and to different kind of interest group uh, how long-term perspective in terms, for example, uh, until 2070 and even uh, longer uh, can challenge the reality that we are facing now. So I think that the, all the rules that are in a way looking far beyond the medium-term hor horizon should be uh, in a way in the pipeline, but maybe uh, at least the fiscal efforts and the uh, uh, minimum left square adjustments for the debt ceiling should be more medium term oriented and not taking into the account all the estimates for longer sustainability um, indicators. On the other hand, uh, I see that many countries are advocating for more transparent and simpler rules, nothing new. There should be as much as possible no connection to calculation of the output gap. Again, uh, uh, we are facing maybe a serious um, problems with the COVID pandemic in the next month. And if we look on the calculation of different kinds of indicators, we can see that we are overheating. This really <laughs> raises uh, clear attention that there has to be done something more on a simpler uh, manner. And the third point, uh, as Maria already mentioned, we have seen these tremendous increases of that level. And comparing it to the Maastricht, I guess that the exogenous shock uh, in, uh, on average in uh, Euro uh, area was roughly uh, up to 20% of GDP percentage points. 
So I think that there is a room of maneuver also to increase the debt uh, threshold and to bind it to the country specific targets. But nevertheless, what is extremely important, uh, we must calm down markets and we must rebuild the trust and confidence also uh, in broader terms to the fiscal policy, how it should look like in, in, in the medium term or start like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me again come back quickly to you. One of, one of the points you raised, namely that you mentioned that that not during the pandemic, but before, you know, the public debt of Slovenia was close to 60 percent and and you had relatively good looking uh, also budget budget surpluses or deficits, yet you were still treated with, with countries strongly violating the rules. So I, I, I mean, this I think would 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 mirror some of the cause which suggests that, in fact, the treaty also says that that only gross errors should be should be in the in the primary focus of the of, of, of rules. But my question is is how to do that? I mean, now we have a very sophisticated system with many legislations and and the. Uh, a code of conduct uh, and uh, almost 300 page long uh, on, the, on the fiscal rules, which explains all the nitty gritty details of how this, sh this should be done. So how can we move toward a system which, which really not looking at all the small little errors or possible errors, but instead focuses on the big ones, but at the same time prevents big ones from happening. So <clears throat> what, what would you say on that? Okay. Um... It's, uh, it's again, it's more a matter of uh, personal opinion. It's no clear position from uh, Slovenian government on it, uh, not yet. Uh, we are still uh, discussing the issue. But I think that we should translate fiscal policy targets more into the nominal terms. We should talk about more, let me say, longer cycles than we used to have them. Uh, it's, it's a history uh, that shows us that the cycles, of course, after the crisis, they are shorter, but on looking from the medium term perspective on them, I think uh, after such a massive impact of the crisis, it really can be looked from the longer perspective. Me personally, I have in mind 10 years period so that we can balance in a way deficits and surpluses in this 10 year period so that we can really easily remove fiscal support that again has to be targeted. But even if we look on, on the investments as, as, as per se, I don't want to say that we should raise again the issue of golden rules. But anyway, in our opinion, I think that we should introduce at least some indicator, additional indicator for monitoring the dynamic of the investments uh, expenditure into this framework. Why? If we look to the countries that were that have already been faced to the EDP procedure, excessive deficit procedure, and looking at the, their time series for gross fixed capital formation in the last year, you can, we can see sincere drops in, in that final years. So that is why I, I would uh, clearly answer we should return more to the nominal targets or recal at least that recalculate them to that extent. Cycle should be way more prolonged, uh, we should increase also the debt thresholds and we really should look with the precautions on the investments, regardless are they treated as one off or, or no, at least some indicator to follow them uh, in, in so-called growth errors should be introduced. Thank you very much, quite, quite a clear list of, of priorities. Now, now, Michel, how do you how do you see the need for fiscal rule reform from from the Netherlands? So, thank you, Zolt, and uh, um, I think that the background that everybody has in mind of the consolidation efforts and the SGP rules is the 2008 experience, where um, a lot of countries feel that the consolidation efforts that were needed uh, back in the day were very damaging to the economic recovery and uh, uh, caused a lot of uh, social turmoil. And we don't wanna uh, repeat a similar uh, situation. Um, so I think uh, uh, against that background uh, uh, and people point to the higher debt levels and, uh, and think, oh dear, are we facing an even worse situation? But the upside is, uh, I think that this situation is very different from the 2008 crisis. 
In 2008, we had very fundamental imbalances in the Eurozone. Um, the Eurozone had a, a, a current account deficit and, and some countries had a very large uh, current account deficits that had to be adjusted. There had been a period of uh, 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 excessive credit growth. Fortunately, we haven't had that this time. So there's no longer a, a credit crunch. Uh, uh, the banking system is in a very good shape. Um, uh, and because we have fewer imbalances, if the temporary support is withdrawn, um, I think we are in a far better shape than we were in the 2008 uh, uh, crisis. So that also makes probably consolidation paths uh, easier. So that is uh, um, maybe the reassuring element that I wanted to bring to the, to the table. On the other hand, if we look, we still see uh, uh, countries uh, with uh, high debt countries with, with high structural deficits of, of minus 3%, uh, sometimes even more. And that is in the long run, clearly unsustainable. So, so something has to be done. And then an adjustment path uh, is, is logical uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, but we should do it in a, in a growth friendly manner. And um, so whereas I think that uh, the path uh, prescribed by, by, for instance, the, the, the SDP, uh, the, the preventative rule with, with the take small steps every year uh, can be useful. We also need to work on, uh, uh, on growth. Um, and there are additional instruments that we've developed in the past couple of years. Of course, the the biggest one is, is the RRF, and let's, uh, uh, let's use that uh, extensively uh, and in a well, uh, in a well manner. Uh, but there are also other tools that, that countries can use. In some of the RRFs, um, countries that have high expenditures, we see that they develop a new system of, uh, uh, of reviews, of spending reviews. Let's learn from each other how to allocate, as Maria said, the money as targeted as possible to the most efficient growth categories. We also saw in previous crises that investments were usually cut and, and uh, consumption, public consumption was not cut. So we are working on uh, public investment management frameworks, multi-year frameworks to ensure that, that investments uh, stay positive and that governments pre-commit themselves to a long pipeline of investments that usually helps if the parliament approves that. Um, uh, and sometimes we focus so much on the uh, expenditure side, but if the state plays a bigger role, we probably also have to look at the revenue side. Um, uh, and the revenue side, we can green our tax system, um, and we can also do cross-country comparisons on the on the revenue side. There are some countries with a rather small uh, revenue base, and some countries with a rather large revenue base. Well, we can learn from that perspective, and by doing all these comparisons, also maybe green budgeting and learning which elements can you finance publicly the best and which privately. For instance, in Germany, all the electric charging stations are financed uh, partially publicly. In the Netherlands, it's done fully privately. Hey, can we learn from each other? Uh, how can we ensure that the private sector takes on this, these burdens uh, as much as possible so that we really use the green finance where it's the biggest bang for the buck? So that is, is the background and then on the uh, rules them, themselves I think what we need is, is probably more transparency simplicity uh, with the ultimate goal of also creating more uh, uh, compliance. In the past I think in 2014-2015 we saw that countries uh, uh, really saw the requirements of the SCP coming out of the crisis as something they wanted to achieve themselves so there was strong compliance Every year we had a statement on what additional efforts uh, uh, countries were doing. But well, this has watered down over the, over the past years. Uh, and that can be because the rules are complex, but we uh, should look at them and find a gradual path uh, towards uh, uh, debt sustainability that also uh, ensures growth. Now, let me come back to you to the public investment point that, that you raised when you, when you mentioned that if countries have better management framework for that and the parliament makes a medium or longer term commitment that can ensure that public investments will be will be preserved. Nevertheless, if the rules were reinstated in their current form from 2023, then uh, in most countries, I mean, with a few exceptions, I think like Luxembourg or Denmark, which already has a budget surplus, 
<laughs> in almost every country, a consolidation has to start. But half of the countries, in our view, will be in an excessive deficit procedure. The other half will be in the preventive arm, but not yet meeting the so-called medium-term objective. Uh, so still adjustment needed. So adjustment will have to come. And you know, when countries have to consolidate, it's always easier to cut uh, investment than you know spending on, on let's say family support or 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 pensions on or, or or other investments simply because of of the political economy i mean <clears throat> investments will help you know a couple of years from now politicians wants to be re-elected re if they cut <clears throat> um, <clears throat> pensions and and other current spending then they might might lose vote. so so my fear is that Yes, now there seems to be a broad commitment and a lot of statements that we want to avoid the mistakes made after the previous crisis. But when the reality of fiscal rules will come in, countries will have to cut and improve their fiscal situations by half percent of GDP on average each year. Then my fear is that uh, investment will be the victim again. So I wonder whether you see this risk or, or you have some other views. Tom? No, this is, is certainly a, a, a risk, um, uh, but on the same time, we now have the RRP, which at least for the high debt countries ensures uh, that in the coming years, uh, often until 2026, uh, investments uh, uh, will be secured. Um, and they are uh, uh, in a contract with a, the with a commission and the council uh, also looks at that. So from that perspective, that is free money uh, uh, that is now available for investment. So for the coming years, I'm not too, too worried about that. Um, and we also see um, and that, that some countries were able to keep their public investments uh, 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 stable. So that's the question. If all politicians say we need to protect investments, why are they cutting them uh, at the moment uh, that they need to be reelected? then suddenly they don't seem to believe uh, that investments are so important. So in a way we need to bind ourselves uh, maybe uh, uh, by also ensuring that parliament uh, uh, knows the, the longer term pipeline, commits to it. And sometimes investments take a very, very long time. So they are associated with the previous government uh, and a new government that doesn't look as, as, favorite, uh, uh, as favorable to them. So what it also helps is to speed up um, the investment process because then the investments will also help uh, uh, in a more cyclical uh, dimension. Um, and, and that is often judiciary procedures and there we can also learn from each other how to speed up, for instance, infrastructure projects. Many thanks, Michelle. Maria, let me turn to you. So I would also interested in, in your view on, on, on investment and on, on in particular on green investment, whether you think that European fiscal rules should explicitly uh, <clears throat> acknowledge that or, or, or treat them differently, or we just indeed should, should rely on, on better internal management and, and on the EU budget plus the recovery and resilience facility <clears throat> um, to support all these green plans. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Zoltan. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, plethora of suggestions and, and rich uh, uh, comments that were my, my colleagues have made. Uh, um, let me see if I can perhaps add a, take a little bit of a different perspective. So, for the sake of adding to the to the arguments, I mean, I certainly agree with you, uh, uh, Zoltan, that we need a bit of everything. I don't see it either or. We need internal uh, reforms that will make the economies more efficient and we need to think about ensuring that investments will happen in a sustainable way. So I don't see this uh, antagonistic, we need both. It's not that if we guarantee investments, we can forget about uh, the structural part, which is absolutely crucial. Um, but I think, you know, in thinking about how to reform the rules, we, we need to make sure that we don't repeat some of the observations that were erroneous uh, during the past 20 years. I mean, the fact of the matter is fiscal policy had turned out to be procyclical. Well, let's try and avoid that. Uh, how do we ensure that we design a framework in which fiscal policy actually plays the right role? And of course, that we don't jeopardize investment because investment is subject to this, uh, uh, to this problem that you've all described, which is the tragedy of the horizons. Uh, namely, uh, you pay, the pay now, but you only see the benefits later, but it's crucial to do that. Otherwise you don't get into a good cyclical um, uh, behavior. So I think it's, it's crucial that whatever rules we come back to, uh, we come back to rules that are 
using fiscal policy correctly on the cycle. And there are measurement issues. I think Katya measure this mentioned. These are the obvious things to do there, if you like the, the low hanging fruit, but also find ways of not uh, disincentivizing investments just as we need them. And this particular thing is, is, is absolutely crucial when it comes to green investments, all which comes to your question. Uh, because the greening part, well, I mean, it is so urgent that if we don't make progress on this, the, 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 you know, there's just going to be horrific consequences. So finding ways of addressing the green investment needs are absolutely crucial. And here I'd like to say the following. Even if we were to have a, a golden rule or even if we were to treat investment differently in whichever, in the most generous way in the rules, which I tend to think we should, but even if we did all that, there will still be an issue of capacity. Not all countries, we have the capacity uh, to deal with the investment needs of the future. What we don't need right now, whichever way we go in is another fiscal crisis. That's what we definitely don't need. So we need to find ways of preventing a fiscal crisis. And you know, if countries invest according to their capacity, not all countries will meet the investment needs that we would be in parallel with particular our green ambitions. So what do you do there? What, how will our green ambitions be satisfied if not all countries have the capacity to invest uh, uh, in, in appropriate ways? What do you deal there? And, and here I, I'd like to sort of go back to what Michelle said about land from the RRF. And, and you know, if I'm uh, misquoting you in any way, Michelle, please stop me. But I think learning from the RRF, and I think I agree with you that there isn't really a problem for the next five years for so long as this, uh, as this package, this very generous package, uh, is uh, is operating, but what happens next? We are not talking about the next five years. We're talking about 30 years from now. We are talking, you know, fit for 55 and beyond. Um, so what, what do you do? What is the path that we must absolutely put in place now, the direction of travel, so that we make sure that in five years from now, we don't start pulling back on some of these uh, of these investments. And, you know, I really think that we need to, in the context of thinking of a new fiscal framework, which has in part the rules, in part our understanding of fiscal policy, but we need to think about certain particular issues in our economic policies pertaining to green in particular, uh, that need to go beyond that. Uh, uh, and, and you know, with that, I would like us to think of the RRF being a tool that preserves the credibility of our policy actions today. Thank you very much, very, very, Maria, thank you very much, very, very clear points. Uh, and in fact, you also address some of the questions from, from the floor. And let me, let me turn to, to the questions now, because we have received, as I see, almost 10, 10 questions. As I see there are a couple of questions related to fiscal policy and a couple of questions related to, uh, to fiscal rules. Now let me uh, raise or read three questions on fiscal policy and maybe ask each of you to answer just one each, if you want to, to, have, to have time. Uh, so we have Martin Large asking whether the effectiveness of fiscal policy has really, really improved or instead uh, simply just there is monetary policy run out of options and we have no more choice but to, but to rely on, on fiscal policy. So again, one question is the fiscal monetary interaction. Another question from Roel Betzma from uh, the University of <coughs> Amsterdam. He asked whether firm support should depend on the tightness of the labor markets or not. So, so whether uh, supports should be withdrawn when, when the labor market is, is, is very tight. And another question on, on inflation by Techminach uh, Malik, sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly, is, is about inflation. I mean, whether fiscal policy <coughs> also has a responsibility for, for generating inflation in a low interest rate environment. So we have 10 minutes left. I hope we can cover these three questions in five minutes. And then in the last five minutes, I will ask another set of questions on, on fiscal rules. So who of you would like to take uh, one of the questions? I'm happy to take either. Uh, whatever question is uh, is left, uh, I, I can also take the last one. Whether uh, because I have a strong view whether government should create inflation or not, uh, that's what Philip Lane proposed uh, uh, recently, and there I honestly uh, strongly disagree. Um, normally we say one instrument has one goal: monetary policy is for inflation, 
And of course, uh, uh, fiscal policy is for stabilization and many other purposes, uh, uh, but, but certainly not uh, uh, inflation. Thank you. Okay, if, if, if I may, since Maria is greater expert in connection to, to uh, the other answer. So in my opinion, if the fiscal rules or support should be interlinkage to the labor market uh, indicators, uh, I think that we should be fully aware of that there are lacks in, in, in when, we, when we see the developments at the labor market and the labor market usually on macro level it's uh, one number that we follow but uh, in terms of supporting sectors coming from different kind of uh, let me say background being restructured being followed on the convergence convergence path or no i don't think that the support system should be linked to the labor market uh, performance, if I put it like this, but I think what was already mentioned that we should have in terms of structural support to forum services, those kind of measures that can be triggered within the, let me say, drop-offs or, or, or at least increases within the employment in specific sectors. Thank you. Uh, so that leaves, I think, Martin's uh, uh, question, if, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, and, and let me thank uh, members of the European Fiscal Board for listening to our conversation. We have read the, the, your views and there is a lot to, to agree with that. Um, Martin is asking whether the effectiveness of fiscal policy has really improved or did monetary policy run out of policy space? And therefore, we have no option but to use fiscal policy. I mean, in textbook terms, uh, in fiscal policy is a lot more effective. And I mean, multipliers when you are in the lower interest rate bound, which we are and have been for a long time. Um, so in that respect, you know, one unit of fiscal policy use is more effective in the interest lower bound by comparison to monetary policy that can't do very much there. I, I'm not entirely sure whether I would say that the fiscal policy has become more effective now. I think fiscal policy has been used more now in a textbook sense on the, sort of, on the right position of the cycle, which it hadn't before, certainly in the previous crisis. Uh, and, and dare I say that even by design, and, and I have a, a game theoretic argument that will justify that, uh, the, the fiscal policy coordination at uh, the Maastricht setup was leading to the underuse of the fiscal instrument, uh, simply because it was, it was taking such uh, uh, account of strategic complementarities that had a bias for underusing uh, the fiscal instrument. And I think that needs to be corrected. We need to find ways of not underusing the fiscal instrument, but correctly using the fiscal instrument. Part of it has to do with measurements, but part of it has with this fear that it is, we have spillovers. The only thing about we should worry about in fiscal policy is the spillover effects. And, and that, I think my view needs to be somewhat different. Now, I will say that a monetary policy is increasingly constrained. We went from using completely out using the traditional monetary policy measures, what we call conventional. Now we've used unconventional monetary policy to huge extents. We have balance sheets at the ECB that are of magnitudes of seven and eight trillion. Uh, so we, we've given monetary policy a stock position. So it makes it almost more similar to fiscal policy. Fiscal policy has a stock position and a flow position. Now monetary policy has a stock position that may can kind of you know, limit the ability of monetary policy to do more in the future. Um, I'm not saying this is wrong, but this is where we are. This is the reality of uh, space, uh, policy space, either on the fiscal and monetary policies that we are a lot more constrained. Debt position is much higher. The balance sheet of this would be much higher. And we are still at the low interest rate bound. Do we increase interest rates, yes or no? Um, so I, I, what I would advocate uh, is not that uh, we have no option but to rely more on fiscal policy. Uh, we have to coordinate better. Fiscal and monetary policy need to coordinate better. Thank you very much, Maria. And in fact, your point on, on spillover, spillover effects are very much related to the, to the next question on, that I would like to ask. Again, I ask a few questions. Uh, feel free to pick whatever, whatever you, you are uh, the most comfortable to, to answer. So, so there was a question uh, whether rules should be identical for everyone or should be different, and also whether the Eurozone countries and the non-Eurozone countries should have the same rules, or it, it didn't ask the question, but I can imagine that, that the, the, the person who asked the question might so that within the Eurozone, due to the spillover effects, we might need perhaps 
uh, a different set of <clears throat> of uh, of uh, fiscal rules. This question was, was asked by Theo Metz. But let me ask three other questions, uh, two on public debt. There was one question, what's your view on the proposal from the European Stability Mechanism uh, recently made that the 60% public debt benchmark should be increased to 100%? And also another very provocative question, and I. I expect what you will answer, but let me ask the question, whether you would uh, uh, promote or whether you would agree to any suggestion which would, which would result in writing down um, the public debt of Eurozone countries in, in whatever way, either via the ECB or, or any, other, any other way. And the very last question <clears throat> um, is on the enforcement of the rules. So we have seen in the past that, <clears throat> that uh, I mean, European-wide enforcement worked to some extent because countries didn't have, you know, huge budget deficits for, for, for decades, but it didn't really work well. So how to improve the enforcement of whatever fiscal rules we have? And in particular, whether the independent fiscal institutions should have a more stronger role. So these are a couple of questions and we have very few short time left, four minutes. So I ask each of you to pick, quickly pick one or two and, and please try to offer very quick answers. Who would, who would start? Shall I go first again? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick two. Um, enforcement by national IFIs, uh, yes, that can help, uh, but there always needs to be a European dimension. Monetary policy is European, therefore enforcement should also be, uh, uh, I think, ultimately be, uh, be European. And the, the real question is, is, is how, uh, that's a million dollar question. So uh, all suggestions welcome. I mentioned a few things in my intervention. Then uh, uh, rules different or identical. Uh, uh, they should be identical because there's never been such a, a nasty uh, remark as uh, because it's France by Jean-Claude Juncker, which uh, really uh, uh, didn't help uh, the European spirit. But the rules are, of course, uh, uh, different per country. If you're high debt, your, your requirement is a bit higher, etc. So, uh, yes, identical, but uh, in impact, uh, they can be different. Thank you. Very clear answers. Okay, if I am the second uh, one, uh, I support uh, the idea that we should at least discuss to, as I, as I already mentioned, to increase the debt threshold, of course, but uh, in my opinion, we should increase it for the size of these exogenous, uh, exogenous shocks. The other part uh, on writing off debt, I don't think this is appropriate way to how to handle it. We know that the general government uh, principles are principles of the entities, and I think that this is clearly also uh, in a way uh, proceeds through, through the commissions and uh, our uh, country's papers that it's uh, it's it's the NGU it's a not non-permanent uh, capacity and on um, greater role on IFIs I, I must say that here I'm a bit uh, confused if the rules remain as they are there is always an argument from macroeconomic point of view and you can argue what was what went wrong in in terms of calculations but more uh, sizable and more uh, qualified uh, recommendations would be needed then from uh, fiscal councils than only to give them greater empowerment thank you very much and maria please <clears throat> so Maybe uh, just to add um, um, just a couple of things, and I don't know whether I'm leaving any question out now, but there were some overlaps in the questions. Um, uh, you know, in the spectrum of complex rules versus simple rules, and one has to also allow for the, 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 the trade off that, you know, simple rules are more enforceable, uh, but less fair in the sense that they're less tailor-made. Uh, so ideally you will want to have specific rules for countries, but this is just a, you know, this is a non-starter. You can never enforce something like that. So I tend to be on that side of the argument that agrees with Michelle actually, that it's better to have the same rules, simpler rules that are enforceable. I think the one thing we need to restore is enforceability of the rules. So let's just find rules that are good, good enough, 
uh, but enforceable. I think that's absolutely crucial because up till now the fiscal framework has never really been truly enforceable. So I think that would be my my, my contribution to that thing. And and like Katya, I don't think uh, uh, right right hands is a, is a good idea, not that because I do not believe uh, that right hands will and can happen. We come from a bus ticket where we did that, but I don't think this is a policy measure. This is a reaction to to deep crisis. It's not a policy measure. It's not that I decide an, an optimal amount of right down now ex ante. It's only an exposed thing, and quite frankly, it should be really the 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 very last resort. Thank you, Maria. Now let's let's indeed hope that we will not need that very last resort, as you as you mentioned, but you. <clears throat> Some of you also mentioned that as, as the ECB will gradually withdraw its, its its support. Certainly, the countries which have very high public debts, we need to be very careful in um, in not risking their debt sustainability. Now, our time is just over, so my very last task is to thank all three of you: <coughs> to Katja Lautar from Slovenia, Michelle Heida from from the Netherlands, and Maria Demertis from Brugge for this very insightful discussion. I think we discussed many many topics. Uh, I very much enjoyed. And let me thank also for all people who followed our, our events for, for following and asking questions and encourage you to follow our future events. So thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you to all. Bye-bye.